welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Heidi Wasson, uh, zooming in from Montreal in my, my self-dubbed California room, if you could do the time zones there. Um, I want to thank Louis Peltier for inviting me to chair this panel. It's really an honor to be included in this discussion. Um, I'm the co-editor of a book with Charles Ackland called Useful Cinema, so it's a, especially gratifying to see that in some small way those ideas are seeing more interesting life in a way uh, than we ever intended, so it's a real honor on several scores. I thought I would introduce the panelists first. Um, I have a question maybe to start us off, and then we'll see how we can evolve a more organic discussion with the group. So let me just introduce the panelists. Um, I'll go in order of the program. Hopefully you've all been able to listen to their very interesting talks. So first I'll just introduce Michael Cowan to you, who's drinking out of a polka dot mug as we speak. Uh, Michael Cowan is professor in the Department of Cinematic Arts at the University of Iowa. He's the author of several books, uh, including the very important, uh, Walter Ruthman and the Cinema of Multiplicity, Advertising, Avant-Garde Modernity. And his recent articles have examined topics ranging from early cinematic shooting galleries to interactive digital advertising screens. He's currently working on a monograph entitled The Social Life of Cinema, an archeology span of the film society in the German speaking world. Um, and Michael's paper was called, but again, hopefully you all heard, Animation and Cultural Geography at the Institut for Kulturforschung, sorry for my German, um, Vienna and Berlin. Uh, I'd like to introduce also Malcolm Cook. If you could just wave, Malcolm, thanks. Malcolm is Associate Professor in Film Studies at the University of Southampton. His book, Early British Animation, was published in 2018, and he has also co-edited a book with Kristen Moana Thompson uh, called Animation and Advertising. And his paper here for us today is called Flashed Before the Gaze of a Crowd, Animation and Advertising in Early British Cinemas, 1909 to 1916. And uh, Scott Curtis, if you could wave Scott. Hi, Scott. Um, Scott is Associate Professor of Radio Television Film at Northwestern University and uh, is currently in the Communications Department at the Northwestern University in Qatar. He is the author of a book called The Shape of Spectatorship, Art, Science, and Early Cinema in Germany, and also the editor of Animation, uh, an anthology on the history of American animation published with Rutgers University Press. He was also, I should add, president of Domitor from 2008 to 2015. Thank you for your service, Scott. Um, Scott's uh, uh, paper today was called Commandance Cartoons, Animation and Health Education in France, 1918 to 1919. So I wanted to get the ball rolling, rolling but then hand the mic off as soon as possible. Um, so I thought I would ask a big question for all for each of the panelists and then let you let you begin uh, to address that in your own ways. Um, I, one of the things I found very exciting about your papers and the concept of useful animation is that it's so historiographically generative and productive. And it, it helps us even in this panel link what might initially be seen as unlinkable or unconnected historical phenomena. So in your panel, we had advertising, animated maps, public health, or you know, papers on shopping, far-right nationalisms, and bugs, right? So we have these kind of fantastic links that seem unlikely, but are very productive. So useful animation as a concept is, is productive historiographically, and it invites very different points of orientation in the way we write film histories in the most general sense. So what I was hoping to get you to start with is to ask you to speak generally about those historiographic orientations that you have taken up as you've begun to build this subfield of useful animation, you alluded in your introduction to a larger project that you're all involved in. Um, so in terms of that larger project or your individual case studies, I just wanted to invite you to say a little bit more about the kinds of historiographic reorientation. So the surprising connections and maneuvers that you find you're, you're discovering or adopting in your work. And maybe also, um, some of the oldies but goodies that have come in handy as well. So like what what new are you discovering about how you're going about writing these histories? And what have you brought forward with you from previous work or established knowledge that you continue to find helpful as you move forward? We can start with, I'll just go in order, maybe Michael could start. <laughs> 
Um, there's a lot of sub questions. I don't know if I'll get to all of them. First of all, thank you, Heidi. We couldn't have asked for a better um, moderator for this panel. And we are influenced <laughs> by your work. It's in our title. Um, the first thing I want to say, because you asked a series of really rich questions, and that was one of the excitements about this, the exciting things about this project for us. Um, I'm, I'm the least expert animation person on this panel, so I'm going to leave those comments to my two co-panelists, but um, we did want to write a different history of animation that would take us to different places and to different kinds of sources. Another way I think of this, and I think of this about useful cinema in, in general, and be curious about your feedback on that, Heidi, is what I love about this field is it makes cinema very relevant for a lot of things that cinema can't be relevant for, including present, right? It makes cinema a precursor to many media phenomena like television and weather reports and whatnot, that suddenly cinema becomes really important in different ways than we've been, than, than we would have thought of 20 years ago, say. And that's definitely true for animation. Um, I'm gonna leave it there and maybe just circle around. I'll get in with other points if I can, because I think this should be a discussion. So, so can I just say, so in other words, what you see, Michael, is it helps illuminate continuities um, that we hadn't maybe noticed before between cinema and contemporary media practices? Yes, I think, I think swimming in the background, if that's a correct metaphor, of all three of our presentations, the, and we've talked about this, you know, um, I could say a lot about this project. It's a project that hasn't really gotten off the ground. So this is the first time we've ever really <laughs> had a chance to present some of our findings together, um, or it's just getting off the ground. But one thing we've talked about a lot, we've been talking about it for a long time. There were lots of institutional changes. There was the coronavirus, there was this and that. Um, so we do want to present this as a project that's sort of looking towards the future and not simply presenting findings, right? But one of the things we've talked about a lot is how much um, every one of the kinds of phenomena that we've identified, because you do, things come back like advertising, maps came back, right? Um, scientific animation, medical animation. Um, and those are attached to different ideas of animation, but they all, they all have relevance for contemporary phenomenon, data visualizations, you know, Google Maps, et cetera, et cetera, if that makes sense. So is that what you meant by continuities? Yeah, and it's not, so I, of course, I'm, as a good academic, I'm shying away from that word continuity, <laughs> but the lines there, there are lines there, absolutely. Malcolm? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks again, Heidi, for, for doing this. Your work's obviously foundational to, to triggering this. Um, yeah, absolutely what Michael said. Maybe I'll take a, a different angle to answering this and saying that diversity that you talk about is one of the appeals here, I guess, because what, we've, what I think we're finding is animation is the glue that sticks all of those together. And in terms of the conference theme, the idea of, of kind of uh, institutions and infrastructures that all of these different disciplines were coming in but they at least initially were coming to the same people to get them to do the work and and that's what's interesting that the uh, you know an animator might be making entertainment films but they might also be making advertising they might also be doing work for you know scientific uh, experiments and so on and so it suddenly makes animation rather than the outlier within this, you know, within cinema history or within wider fields of knowledge production, that animation is the, the center, the thing that, that glues all of those things together. And, and especially some of the more conceptual ideas about movement or life that come up again and again in animation suddenly become very important to lots of different fields. And I think we can, we can see how say processes and change over time that's so central to, to animation and of course cinema but but cinema as a form of animation become important to lots of other fields they're thinking not just about static uh, kind of systems but but processes changes over time and so animation's both a great tool for displaying that but also drives other disciplines to think about that in, in more depth. And I guess for me as a, a primarily an animation historian, that's the appeal that suddenly we see the importance of both the techniques, but also the concepts that come with animation. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll just uh, uh, continue with um, Malcolm's points about uh, process and function and how these uh, new uh, interesting ideas in the, in, uh, the sciences, for example, uh, manifest themselves in animation. I've 
done a lot of work on scientific film, live action scientific film, right? And coming to an, an, uh, an approach that focuses on animation, it turns out that, uh, uh, that we, we, we need to look a little bit more to the role of the figural uh, in scientific representation, for example, right? Figures, diagrams, charts, right? And how those function in knowledge production. And it turns out that animation has uh, uh, an equal role in knowledge production in scientific experimentation, laboratories, uh, and, and you know, communication. We might think of science and animation in terms of like a, 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 a Disney health film, right? Uh, but there's an extraordinary amount of animation out there uh, that uh, aligns itself more with the hard sciences uh, and is not, meant, not necessarily meant for the public eye, but is basically for experts. And so thinking about uh, what's challenging for me and what's interesting historiographically is how uh, the, this emphasis on uh, the figural role of, of representation in science is changed uh, once animation comes into the, 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 the equation. Can I get in one more term here? I'm going to borrow Scott's term that I learned from your paper, Scott, which is, um, am I pronouncing this correct? Proso, proso, can you Prosopographic. Prosopographic, right? Prosopographic histories about the meeting of people and agendas coming from very different places that don't necessarily fit into our traditional views of film history. So in my case study, for example, you have the meeting of a cultural geography with great visions of world peace, an electromechanical company that happened to be getting into um, you know, producing these portable projectors and someone who was working in the German foreign ministry and was very concerned with sort of propaganda film, right? And, that's, and that meeting produced one of the first sort of centers of animation in the German speaking world. Like that's the kind of history we want to write and it's a really messy history, right? So we have some hypotheses, but they're still being, and they're going to work out. There's a lot of contingency here as well, I guess is what I'm talking I about. I should have used that word. I should have said that. <laughs> I did in my presentation, but I, in, the, in your answer, in, in my answer, I should have said that. We should all be using that word, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's a good word. But don't say it 10 times fast. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank, I think that's a fabulous way to start. There are questions in the chat, so I, I take it to be my job to try to um, uh, present them to you. This is a question for Michael, I think, about maps. And uh, it's a question about uh, whether or not these maps were being recycled across films or different countries, did they, the maps themselves travel? Um, were there stylistic elements that were common or different or hidden signs that can help to identify the maps beyond this, their cinematic iterations? Yeah. I have to really preface this question and something Scott did in this paper very well and I didn't do as well. This is a project that, um, as I said, is still in its beginning stages. I was due to go look at some of both the films and some major sources in March of this year. I bought my ticket, got my hotel room and the coronavirus. <laughs> so I don't have answers to all the questions, precisely these kinds of questions. So I have to speculate. Um, um, I'm still missing a lot of sources on this project. Um, my speculation is, yes, sometimes they did travel, but not as much as we think, because a lot of these films were made for very specific purposes. Now, there were some repeat films. As I said, there were a series of films that had to do with Versailles, that had to do with the um, Silesian territories. I imagine that they were reusing some footage there. Um, but beyond that, it's hard for me to, to really answer that question with as well as I should. And uh, thank you very much for that. There's a, a question for each of you, which is kind of an interesting question, which is about the use of puppets. Um, mm -hmm. And the question is, can you say anything, uh, if you're aware of the use of puppets across these different forms of useful animation, European, American, uh, Russian, anything that you can say about puppets in useful animation? Yeah, I could, I could maybe start. I think they're especially common in advertising areas. Um, some obvious reasons, I think that obviously you can animate the actual product if that's the point of advertising more generally is to make the product seem alive to consumers then animating the product directly through stop motion techniques is useful so some of the examples from 
from Kino ads that I mentioned, Waterman's Inc. and so on, were, were very much rooted in taking the product and, and making it move in, in some way. And that continues then to become important later on in the 30s or whatever. Someone like uh, George Powell, you know, mm. is very famous for his stop motion animation that was used for advertising. I think there's a, a perhaps more interesting and deeper point here that I was trying to get to in my paper, which is stop motion is very different from other types of filmmaking. And so it stands out, which attracts the eye and is important in terms of, of advertising again, but also differentiates it from other types of films. And for lots of exhibitors and for lots of people in the industry, advertising, certainly in Britain, needed to be different. It needed to stand out. And that's, that's partly where we start seeing animation and live action being differentiated for, for some of these reasons. And that happens in different places at different times for different reasons. Um, but but also finally, I think there is a, there's still lots of blurry lines here. So for example, the British map films that Percy Smith made contain lots of what we would probably call stop motion on top of the map. So they they're not they don't have the definitions and distinctions that we make between stop motion and, and cut out or drawn animation and cell animation is very new. So you'll see a map which is largely drawn material with some cotton wool used as clouds to be the kind of, um, you know, stop motion animated on top of it, all those kind of effects. And obviously cut out animation blurs that boundary. In one sense, it's two dimensional. And so we think of it as drawn animation, but it's manipulated far more like a puppet, like a two, two dimension, by a, like a three dimensional object. So there's, this is an interesting period because there's, those distinctions that we have didn't necessarily exist and weren't used in the trade. Scott and Michael might have more. Yeah, I, I, in, uh, uh, you, you won't see puppets too often in science and medical films. However, you will see, as Malcolm notes, stop motion uh, in a variety of different ways. Um, uh, but especially in educational films, Right. Uh, if we look at uh, films designed for uh, the public, educational films, you'll have much more uh, stop motion in those films than you will in uh, the the training films that I've seen, for example, that are meant to train experts. Uh, so it, it is something of a of a uh, a moment of spectacle, the stop motion uh, effect uh, that is. Uh, uh, appropriated for that very purpose, or at least perceived to be spectacular. Uh, and so it's, it's, also, it's also expensive uh, because it's very labor intensive. Uh, and so, and it's, it's difficult. Uh, so it's often used sparingly. Yeah, just to echo, also echo the answers that have been given. Um, I have seen a fair amount of puppet animation in advertising and not elsewhere. And I think this has to do with something that Malcolm was getting at in his paper, that quickly animation and advertising takes on the function of providing a kind of, um, how should I say, a differentiation of function. Like this is advertising film. It's gonna be honest about what it's doing. It's gonna be funny. Like advertising film was funny very early as everybody who's had been to a recent Portanone festival knows. Um, and that's where the puppet animation could come in. So for example, there's one I'm thinking of by Julius Pinchafer about a film star who's a diva film star who's got a headache and can't possibly act and they give her a bare aspirin and she's fine, right? So this is the kind of ham it up version of puppet. I know there were up at other types of puppet and other modes of puppet animation. So I'm not trying to reduce puppet animation as such to that, but I'm saying that's how it often worked out in advertising film. Thank you. So there's a, there's a question in the uh, chat that uh, is for Michael, but I thought I might bring it out and ask the same question to the three of you. In your in your presentation, you beautifully lay out three kind of core overlapping concerns that subtend the larger project: iconography, infrastructures and institutions, and then disciplinary knowledge or epistemologies. And the question is directed towards Michael, but again, I wanna give it to all of you, which is about that third category and the ways in which animation may or may not have fed back into the transformation of disciplinary knowledges that we normally think of as existing outside or separate from animation or film per se. So could you talk a little bit about that third category and how you understand that 
that movement or vector back out towards the transformation of disciplinary knowledge? Anyone want to take a shot? It's a tough. It's a tough one. <laughs> that is that is the most difficult question. Yes, you could have you could have come up with that's the one, right? <laughs> uh, uh, and it will require a lot more work on our part. <laughs> Let me put it that way, um, because it's it requires a, a kind of diachronic approach to the discipline, right? You'll have we'll have to, you know, examine, uh, you know, representational patterns within a particular discipline uh, and figure out the role of animation within that and see if there's any cause effect links into that. I mean, I have seen bef in, in, you know, I have alluded to or seen uh, diagrams and efforts on the printed page uh, where people are trying to mimic animated uh, approaches to uh, process or function uh, by being very, very uh, uh, putting a lot of emphasis on movement, on simulated movement through uh, arrows and things like this. Uh, and that's something that comes about, uh, you know, after animated films have become uh, prominent within scientific uh, discourse. But I'm still not even sure if that's, you know, a cause effect chain. Right. Michael yeah. and Malcolm surely have some, though. <laughs> I can elaborate on what Scott's saying, too. That's a question that's an analytical question that is a little bit of a chicken and an egg question. Um, I believe very strongly from everything I've seen, and this would go for Scott's and my presentations, that the sciences, that process, movement, animation, not in the filmic sense, but in the larger sense, was a key object of knowledge generally in the late 19th century across the disciplines. And so that made film a very desirable media. All of these disciplines, when they discovered film, when they got into film, there's a huge learning process that goes on. In every case I've read about where there's any kind of um, sort of biographical reflection on what happened, they all say, oh yeah, we thought we'd have to do a few drawings and that would be it. No, no we didn't know we had to do 12,000 or whatever. You know? and, and so there's a learning process. And I think what, what I would answer for my case study that I did is, no, there's not a feedback. There might be one that I didn't see, but I didn't see an immediate feedback of the type Scott's talking about where all of a sudden, you know, print maps are trying to imitate the cinema. In fact, quite the opposite, I saw a differentiation. I saw a discipline learning how to make maps for the cinema. And this is something you get in statistics as well. Like how do we make statistical films that people can understand because we're in an ephemeral medium, we're in a medium that moves, we're in a medium that disappears too, all too quickly and they can't retain all of this complex visual information. So we need to simplify. Um, but, but the print maps, so I'm going to come back to my example specifically here, the print maps that I think are kind of related to what's going on in this film continue to be much more complex. They're color coded, they're textured, they've got a lot more text going on in them. And it's because they're made for people, you know, looking through a book, they're made for schools for children to learn, right? And so they assume a learning process of how to read them. You can't assume that in the cinema. Um, and things have to be immediately accessible. So that question is going to work itself out in various ways. But I do think, um, to come back to my first point, which is building on what Scott just said, I do think there's a, a kind of movement towards movement, excuse the tautology, but a movement towards a focus on process and movement in the sciences that makes cinema desirable. And cinema is also, in some sense, a catalyst for that. How you prove that in an individual case, well, I don't want to set up something where we get really lucky or not. You know, it's, it's more of a kind of global discussion there. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. But I think it's, I feel quite confident to be able to say these ideas about movement and animation existed before cinema and that they could be seen as a, a motivator to the development of animated techniques um, that's perhaps not been considered within the history of animation up till now, that actually that, that drive was there. Um, the other, the effect, the other way around, is much harder to prove. Not least because we're not, we're not experts in those other disciplines to the same extent. So it's much harder to say we can definitely see a change of uh, attitude, a change of behaviour in another discipline. Whereas I have much more confidence to be able to talk about the, the film. But that's that's part of the appeal of the project. I think there are examples in you know, I've been looking at economics films a bit later and it's clear 
ideas about change and movement are what motivates people from other disciplines to come to animation. But once they start using it, they realize it makes them think about their subject differently. Not least if we go back to details, the painstaking process required for animation at this time meant that they had to spend a lot of time thinking about it. And that that's what all animators do. They have to, they don't just get a camera and produce a film. They have to sit there and plan it out and think about it. So for an economics film or for the mathematics films, they really have to plan that process and calculate that process. And that makes them think differently about their subject, the, the painstaking process to bring it back to the, the sort of material of creating animation. So this may be our last question. I believe it's for all of you again. It's a question about uh, recruitment and training, uh, like a, as expertise moves across areas. So somebody who's not an animator becomes an animator. Someone who's a map maker becomes an animator. Could you talk a little bit about anything you know with regards to that movement of expertise and professional uh, purview? I guess I can start. Uh, I mean, the, the Commandant example is a good one. Uh, and and I, I'm not positive if it's a, um, it's a pattern, but let me, let me play it out here for you. Colin Don's a scientist, right? Who also is a filmmaker uh, for Path A, uh, but he hires two animators to do the public health films with him, right? And these are two people who have already learned the craft. And through that, he, he uh, uh, gains some familiarity with animation. He already had a little bit uh, before the war, uh, and he continues to use this as a as a technique. But what I found also, even in contemporary today, what happens is that very often that same sort of configuration exists, that you have a lead scientist who goes to find a couple animators to help conceptualize this thing that they want to make. Uh, and so it's, it's a kind of, uh, it's, a, it's, it's not a as far as I can tell, uh, at least in those examples, it's not like the scientist is trained to become an animator. It turns out instead that the scientist learns a lot about animation through this process and the animators learn a lot about science in that process as well. So that's, that's what I've seen, but I think you know, there might be other cases in, that Michael and Malcolm could speak to. Yeah, advertising again is quite an, is one of the easier fields to prove it in, I think, because there's the the graphic quality um, of print advertising meant it was a natural progression for filmmakers to for for people to become filmmakers and animators. So there's a you know strong trend for print illustrators coming through into cinema, and that includes from advertising. But I think. The, the other thing is the kind of pairing, maybe Scott was getting at this, often there's a, a pairing and it's not about an individual, but it's about the coming together of different people and them exchanging. And I think that's really interesting as well as it goes beyond the individual filmmaker, individual animator to become a studio or a team or a, a, a collaborative effort where they're, they're exchanging disciplinary information with each other. Um, and that's certainly, happens into the 20s and 30s. I'm not sure about the sort of very earliest period as yet. Yeah, I don't have too much to add to that. I would just emphasize a couple of things. Almost all the people, at least in the ones I've been looking at, almost all the people who end up doing this animation came from elsewhere. And I think that's true across the types of animation we're looking at, that they were illustrators, they were cartoonists, they were map makers, they were scientific illustrators. And so when Scott says, yeah, you go to an animator, it's also, they go to somebody like, and correct me somebody if I'm wrong, but as far as I know, Bartosz was, a, Bartosz was an artist, but he was learning animation at the same time. So um, Hans Lick in Vienna went to Bartosz, but both of them had to learn what animation was. And so, as I was saying earlier, I've just come, come across so many cases where people talk about the learning process. So we're really in a, you know, the, the, the world of kind of professional animators is not yet established here. If it's established anywhere, it's in advertising. It probably comes first in advertising. But all of these sciences and educational ventures, these are, these are people in the education industry, right? And they're like, oh, yeah, I, want, I, I need film to show this. Well, what can I do? Oh, I'm an artist. And so 
yeah, that, that's the kind of learning and I forgot exactly the terms of the question, but the kind of retooling that goes on. Um, and it's worth thinking about when, when looking at these, the, the finished products. Yeah, and I should add too that the two animators that Commandant hired, Lord Talk and O'Gallop, were actually becoming animators or they, this gig made them animators. They, they didn't have a, a you know, large uh, you know, experience, a lot of experience with animation before this gig with Commandant. And so it's exactly like Michael said, they were learning on the job and getting better at it as they went along. Uh, but they had a proclivity for it, right? They, they were already illustrators. They had already made a couple animated films. They'd already worked with Emil Cole. So they, they knew more than the average Joe. Yeah. This is, by the way, this is, by the way, at least in my context, very parallel to what's going on in experimental animation. Like right? <laughs> these painters who become animators. Right. And sometimes they're rubbing shoulders, as in the Institut for Kultur portion. So I'm going to take presenter's privilege and ask one final question. And it, it seems to me like something, it's an, an unfair question, but I think it's a productive question, which is basically about useful sound or how is sound important to all of this? It's easy, it's obvious to go to the graphic and the illustrative. And I'm just wondering if you can say anything about sound in relation to the films or the phenomena, the presentational modes that you're thinking about. Mm -hmm. I can't say it in relation to the map films, but I, there is a big, um, there's a lot of pioneering work in sound that goes on in advertising film in the German context, at least. And even sort of pre-sound thinking about rhythm and the usefulness of rhythm as a way to sell products, right? That then goes right into what the experimental filmmakers are doing with visual rhythms and then with sound, um, it makes it a kind of natural outlet, but um, your question might've been looking for something different. Well, it's, I, I it's think, kind of the fun version of it, do maps have sounds? Um, maybe that's the other way to ask, anyhow. It's a really good question that I'm gonna to start to think about because I haven't read anything about, um, you know, what kind of sound was playing at these um, showings. I'm sure there was some kind of accompaniment. I think there's a, there's, there's some, I think there's lots of answers to this. It's a really good question actually, Heidi, that I, would, I should have thought about more than I have actually. I think there's, one is talking about slides and things, the fact that these didn't necessarily have any sound, that, that slides, for example, would be shown while people were talking. And we, we always need to remember the role of the audience and how they would engage. A bit later, that turns into, you know, sing-alongs are quite, quite important and become quite regular part of um, advertising films where you're, you know, I've used this term before, animating the audience, that they, they're engaging the audience to to become involved with the product by being an active audience. That's, we all know here that early cinema had a very active audience. It wasn't that passive um, audience that is often described and sing-alongs are the perfect example for that. And then of course, for the coming of sound, the novelty of sound becomes a, a, a new great way to um, do this. Uh, I, yeah, I, but I'm sure there's more answers there to be thought about. Yeah, I've got nothing for common dawn, I'm afraid, Heidi, but uh, uh, the thinking about this same topic, you know, as it goes through the century, what's interesting, I guess, is the sound of things that are not visible, right? The sound of the imperceptible, right? Uh, the sound of space, the sound of, um, of, of atoms that you find in Power of Ten, Earth, Powers of Ten, Earth, you know, films like this. Right, uh, and you know that that Harvard film on life of the cell, right? That uses a kind of um, science fictiony soundtrack uh, that's really quite striking, uh, and I find that kind of soundtrack is very common in a lot of these um, uh, uh, nanotechnology demonstration films, for example, right? So. Uh, that could be a whole nother avenue of exploration. Well, and for the Commandant films that you're talking about, you could imagine really creepy macabre sounds, right? Yes, um, you can. So, yeah, yeah. so that's, that becomes a kind of fun question because it's expressive yeah, yeah. and uh, affective. Um, right. Yeah. Okay, I think I'm going to get kicked off of Zoom permanently if I don't bring this to a conclusion. 
Uh, so I'd like to thank Malcolm and Scott and Michael for their fantastic papers and the fantastic uh, comments and questions. And thank you to the audience. And um, thank you very much.